Hey, good afternoon to you. Mark Seth of HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for March the 5th now, Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. Before I get started, I just want to mention something real quick. A uh, big part of the off-season portion of the discussion that I do each week does touch upon lower 48 weather. It's not hurricane season, and so I discuss winter storms, upcoming big impact weather events, just kind of a quick glance at what's happening across the lower 48, uh, mainly just to keep it at top of mind for you. But this past weekend's tornado outbreak across the Deep South, especially there in Alabama and specifically in Lee County, where at least 23 people were killed, reminds us that it is severe weather season. It's beginning to unfold. The warm air coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, meeting the cold, dry air coming south and east out of Canada, that classic battle line sets up, and we're going to have these periods of severe weather from here on out. Uh, it, it's begun, and so I'm going to focus more and more on that in the portion of the discussion. We'll go over some things, obviously, that take a look at the tropics, sea surface temperatures, El Nino, things like that, that we typically look at in the first part of this discussion. But here on out, I uh, really want to focus upon the severe weather threat as it manifests itself over the coming weeks and few months until hurricane season begins. And, you know, a big reason behind this, and it makes perfect sense, uh, a lot of the people that I reach here on social media uh, that watch this, you know, especially the on-season discussion during hurricane season, they live in the southeast. And not only can they be reached by tropical cyclones, storms and hurricanes that move in from the Gulf or the Atlantic, but they're also affected by severe weather in those same areas. You know, a hurricane can penetrate hundreds of miles inland with destructive winds and flooding and even severe weather of its own in those outer bands. We get tornadic threats from hurricanes and during the off season here, uh, especially March, April and into May, that becomes more prevalent uh, from a different set of circumstances in the atmosphere, but it affects a lot of the same people that hurricanes can affect. So we're going to start really focusing on that as I go forward over the next several weeks leading up to this, which hurricane season, 87 days away, believe it or not. Now at 87 days, you know, what are you supposed to do? Well, this early, do things like get the generator checked, you know, don't put it off. Take it to a small engine repair shop if you've used it before. Uh, if you've never used it at all. You know, maybe ask your local small engine shop if you could bring it by and just get some lessons on it. You know, maybe they'll do that, uh, you know, at no cost as a, a good will, a good gesture to educate you about generator usage. Um, you know, talk to your insurance company. Uh, find out what's covered, what's not. If you don't have insurance, especially if you are someone who doesn't own a home yet, you're renting somewhere, look at getting renter's insurance and do it now. And these are the things you can do ahead of time that make great sense. They're economically feasible in most cases, and uh, they're things that can make things a lot less stressful when a hurricane does come knocking on the door, which could be, you know, within 87 days from now. Who knows? Uh, remember, the eastern Pacific season starts about two weeks before all the Atlantic activity usually does, at least on a calendar, May 15th for the eastern Pacific and June 1st for the Atlantic Basin. Okay, looking at the anomaly chart here from the NOAA NESDIS, which differs pretty substantially out in this region anyway uh, with its temperature anomalies, but this is the chart that I have used for many, many years, and there's different methodologies. I've tried to explain this before. Um, it's not that I don't care, but I'm not going to show every single chart. This is what I've used. I trust it. It seems to do me well, so why stray from what's worked for me and uh, before we get to the Atlantic and look at all this yeah the El Nino out here this weak El Nino trying to strengthen a little bit there's no denying it you can see this warm plume along the equatorial Pacific now there's supposed to be a period coming up <clears throat> of enhanced trade winds uh, out here where these trades from east to west blow a little harder than normal perhaps so we'll keep an eye on that and see if that starts to set up and try to become semi-permanent or is it a transient feature or what. Uh, but the El Nino 
still growing just a little bit. It's not that significant just yet, and um, we'll see what happens. The, some of the models indicating the El Nino will fade out by the summer. Some of them saying that the El Nino will hold on through the summer. So it's kind of a mixed bag there, but the models are often terrible at this lead time going into several months from now. It's just, you know, hit or miss. That's why we can at least just monitor this on a weekly basis and even a monthly basis and see what's happening. So yes, in the Atlantic Basin, let's look over here. I'm going to draw this little box around what includes the main development region. This is what it looks like out there today. See, 3, 4, of course this was updated. They actually updated it today, but the stamp says yesterday. Nobody put it on their site yesterday and it showed up today. But anyway, uh, March 4th, 2019 is when this was updated. This is what it looked like last year. So it's a little warmer in the Atlantic compared to last year. Not that much so. Uh, you can see some subtle differences, especially you know, right here just off the coast of Africa. Uh, again, this is last year, and here we are this year. I would say it's you know year over year a little bit warmer in the Atlantic Basin, but definitely warmer in the Enso regions out here. You can clearly see that last year coming off the near La Nina conditions from 2017 into 2018, and this year much, much warmer, but still a weak El Nino state overall. So what does it look like at the subsurface? This is where I like to look. This is the key for me, anyway. And this is quite intriguing. you got these two bookends here of cold relative to average, one in the far west Pacific, all the way down, you know, is this just noise in the data? I don't know, it's kind of interesting though, uh, this cold spike all the way down to 450 meters deep, and then in the eastern Pacific, this one area, this blob of cold, if you will, uh, down on the subsurface, but then, you know, those bookends, as I call it, uh, they both flank uh, this large continent size, you know, huge area of above normal sea surface or uh, subsurface temperatures. These are down in the depths there, more than 100 meters deep in most cases here. There's your 100 meters deep line. Hey, it's, I drew it straight. It's a miracle. Uh, but that little area that it goes right through there is about 5 Celsius above average. And these different gradient lines through here, you know, that indicates a pretty healthy area of warmth that will try to make its way up to the surface. And then let's see if those trades come in and mix it real well and kind of mix it out. Because there really isn't that much more waiting. This is a big conveyor belt. It generally goes like this. Uh, it's not that simple, but this is generally what happens. You get this uh, downwelling in the western Pacific from these westerly wind bursts. And then that water moves through these what are called oceanic Kelvin waves towards the east, it surfaces. Um, not exactly like this, but this is just an easy way to explain it. And the trade winds try to disperse it. If those trade winds are weaker than normal, then this water is able to just fester along the surface, very warm, uh, because there's no mixing of it. It's like not blowing across the cup of coffee that you picked up at Starbucks or whatever to cool it off. You know, if you blow across the top of it, it helps cool off that surface. But underneath, there's more hot coffee waiting. And that's what this is. This is all the hot coffee. And up here is the top. And we'll see if those trade winds blow the surface to cool it off. That's a pretty good analogy, if I may say so myself. All right, moving on along. Gulf of Mexico, February 13th. Gulf of Mexico, yesterday, March the 4th. It's really interesting. You get this noticeable increase in the 26 Celsius line, which is right here, and that's roughly 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to just draw it in. That's where it is, and you see that you know it really filled in from the 13th until March uh, 4th yesterday, which you would expect. But this is interesting. Look back on the uh, 13th at all the shelf water up here, and you know how close to the coast it was. But then if you move to yesterday, it expanded a little bit, the coldness. So, I, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, but it's just interesting that it's got this push south and east overall of the shelf water. I mean, I guess it's been, you know, it's still winter. So there you go. I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, you got the very warm water coming 
and starting to congeal down here in the uh, not congeal but you know what I'm saying it's it's warmer down here the sun angles higher and the Caribbean is warming up and that gets uh, injected into the Gulf of Mexico through the loop current and all those processes yet as you can see that shelf water advancing south just a little bit because it's still winter up here in these northern latitudes uh, in the northern hemisphere still winter all right in the Atlantic um, I guess this is all sea ice up here most of that is but then down there a little 26 Celsius 25 in the Gulf Stream gradient still pretty tight down there the temperature gradient that is the difference in temperature over distance uh, but this will be loosening up and it's gonna be cold for a little bit here in early March uh, but after March is over of course April May sea surface temperatures really start to warm up and as of you know as yet we still have not seen a major nor'easter you know one of these systems that cuts across and just cranks up out here over the warm waters of the Gulf Stream uh, off of Nantucket or wherever Long Island hadn't seen it nothing major at all uh, pretty rare to have that happen it's March though and it could still happen I remember I went after one the very first one I think it was late March of 2014 March 25th or so if I'm not mistaken it was around that time frame almost to April I think that's when it was somewhere around there but we'll keep watching and see if one of those creeps up I'll show you that uh, when we get to the uh, this part the lower 48 part I don't know what I was going to show in that other directory but whatever all right um, lower 48 weather as I mentioned the threat of severe weather this time of year uh, is important to take a look at and one of the reasons I'm going to be looking at it closer and closer I want to go out uh, to the Great Plains on one of those high-risk days that we sometimes see uh, you know what I'm talking about where the SPC Storm Prediction Center will outline an area usually somewhere right out in here uh, as a high risk and that will be inside of an area of moderate and then that's usually inside of an enhanced and you know whatever it kind of looks like that with the greatest concentration of uh, threat of you know violent tornadoes large hail etc will be in a relatively small geographic area uh, that oftentimes like I said is about that big it's not thousands of miles across and then what I want to do is not go tornado chasing I think that's become very dangerous these days because of how many people do it but rather set up my live cams in this sort of fence uh, across the eastern part of that high risk and then as these supercells develop and cut across we see what we get that's something I want to try to do in May it's a whole project that I'm working on as part of our patreon and hurricane track insider membership uh, they're the ones that are going to help fund it so I'm gonna be keeping an eye on that as well as pointing things out uh, in the severe weather realm to help keep you safe alright so this is the initial map from the GFS we'll take a look at the next couple of weeks just to get an idea of the weather patterns couple things to keep an eye on yeah we had some snow in southeast North Carolina this morning it's all gone now at least most of it should be I saw some wet snowflakes here I call them dying snowflakes in Wilmington but up in Jacksonville he had three inches Whiteville had a good dusting to maybe an inch uh, I noticed that Eric Webb uh, storm chased, if you will. He snow chased today, assuming he came from Charlotte down 74 east, and he went over to Whiteville, and he nailed some uh, good snowflakes there. He was reporting on it on Twitter. Way to go, Eric. Out west, another storm system getting ready to come in, nice comma shape to it. This atmospheric river phenomenon continuing. So watch as we progress here. Uh, this is 24 hours out and by that time yes sir we got more action heavy rain in the lower elevations heavy snow in the higher elevations it is going to be green out west this spring and then it'll all turn brown when the dry season comes in and we'll probably have a terrible fire season next fall the cycle continues nevertheless let's continue with this this is 48 hours out valid uh, on Thursday morning uh, most of the weather is out west still kind of cold in the east but it starts to moderate and that's important to note all right we got this high sitting off shore here almost a Bermuda high and you notice this return flow 
around that high doing what? Pumping moisture in to the deep south over here. Louisiana and points uh, east and west of there. Pay attention to that. It's very important because what happens as we get towards uh, four days out, a pretty potent low pressure area there, 990 millibars over western Kansas, strong flow ahead of it, uh, probably some jet stream energy cutting across that we can't see on this particular chart. And then lo and behold, look what's happening over the weekend here. Saturday afternoon, even in the eastern parts of Tornado Alley proper, and then down here uh, in parts of, uh, I guess you call it the Arklatex area, right? Louisiana, eastern Texas, parts of Arkansas, severe weather threat this weekend, and this just shows me that it's there. This doesn't start to show the specifics. There's other models as we get closer, other experts that will do a much better job of explaining it, but this paints the big picture. That is a signature of a pretty nasty severe weather setup coming for parts of the Plain States, Iowa, down to parts of Kansas, Missouri, and then even into Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, maybe eastern Oklahoma, and then back on the northwest side you can clearly see more snow for parts of the upper Midwest blowing snow at that. Minnesota's probably going to have some blizzard conditions. And look at that low, folks, 980. And then these streaks here just show me that's a severe weather signature in, in my mind, okay, so we got to really pay attention to that over this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, overnight, Saturday night, and then some of that spreads into parts of the deep south, okay, let's see how close that gets to the areas that were just impacted, and then this low pressure just goes nuts up here over eastern Minnesota, western Wisconsin, and bam, up into Canada with just incredible blizzard conditions again, uh, and then the storm spreads out, moves offshore, and we reset the pattern now we're a week out and again another storm system pretty potent now coming out of the four corners region of the southwest and heavy rain parts of Oklahoma uh, maybe up into Kansas with blizzard conditions again probably on the northern side that heavy rain moves across eastern Texas and maybe some more severe weather right there that is a little bit more than eight days away or so down in the deep south once again. So active, active, active as these storms roll off the Pacific, come across and then some fashion or another, you know, turn the corner well inland. None of these big nor'easter tracks uh, as we go out about the next 10 days or so. That's where we'll stop. There's day 10 right there. All right. So, you know, a few things interesting to watch in the tropics. That El Nino uh, situation. Let's see if I can bring me back. <clears throat> kind of intriguing because some of the models are saying, yeah, the El Nino will go away. Some of them are saying, no, it's going to hold on. So it, it, it adds to the mystery of the whole thing because that will have a big bearing on what happens during the hurricane season coming up. Uh, and then, of course, we've got to keep an eye on all this potential severe weather. And I'll talk about it again on uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week whichever day I get to do the outlook and discussion here. But real important, make sure you follow your local TV meteorologist that's your favorite, your local severe weather expert. Um, you don't need me to tell you that. I think hopefully by now, if you're savvy enough to watch this video, however you're watching it, you know who to look for out there in weather world to keep yourselves informed because it is an active period of weather, even though it's not hurricane season. And we got to make sure that you are around to be able to, you know, enjoy these videos in the future, right? Like I say, look at it as just a selfish reason that I want you around. It's marketing. If you're not alive to enjoy these videos, what good am I? So it's my job to keep you safe. All right, have a good rest of your week. Thanks, as always, for tuning in from your side of the screen. I am Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. Thank you for watching. I'll talk to you again next week.